prayer, and then we will jump right on in. God of God in heaven, we come before you, thank you for this day. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. Wonder if this is in heaven. We know that you sit high, but you act low in all things. You are in each and every one of your children. Thank you that you intervene uh, when you see fit, because we know that your plan will not be thwarted. There is nothing that can stop your plan, uh, but we ask that we be willing vessels as part of your plan, um, as you continually reveal yourself to us um, so that we know who you are and that we know that our identity is secure in you. And it's not about what we do, but in whose we are. And we are yours if you have called us. So we thank you, we praise you, we submit this time to you. Bless those that are on their way, bless those that are not here tonight. Um, it's in Jesus' name that we pray so that you can get the glory on our praise. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're going to jump right on in. So, week one, we talked about our identity, we talked about the identity of people. Started with the identity of God. Back in Genesis, he was known as El, and you can kind of put in what other ones you want to put in there. So El Shaddai, El whatever that face was, El anything. That's who God was. God that sees me, the God who knows when to say enough, the God who made me. But then he revealed himself to Moses in a very unique way. He revealed his name. To Moses, that of Yahweh. Then we come to Pharaoh. Pharaoh, to everybody on earth, to man, he was quote unquote a God, and God had to show him, <laughs> You are not a God, you are a man, just like everybody else. There is nobody like me. The Israelites, the Egyptians looked at them as slaves, God looked at them as his firstborn is firstborn. Then in week two, we talked about to know. And the purpose of the plagues, it wasn't just to be spiteful and to be mean and to be just execute vengeance and anger and everything on Pharaoh. It was so that Pharaoh would get to know who he is. But remember, Pharaoh said, who is the Lord? Who is your Lord? I don't know him. Who should I be to obey him? If I don't know him, why am I going to obey him? So the purpose of the plagues is so, number one, the Egyptians will know who Yahweh is. So Pharaoh will know who Yahweh is. And ultimately also that Israel will know who Yahweh is. And as I said, you will know, you will know, you will know that I am Yahweh. So let's jump into our homework. When we take about two or three, how have you hardened your heart, Yahweh? How have you hardened your heart to Yahweh? Me, anytime I'm going to lie. Correct. How have you? <laughs> You hardened your heart to Yahweh. And since you spoke up, you'll be the first, Rick. How have you hardened your heart to Yahweh? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I've known, I've known love God since I was probably 10, 12 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, shamefully, I would have to say from the time I was late teens until my late 20s, I was kind of there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and I would say, uh, one those times, numerous times during one those times, my spoken against uh, the Lord in terms of not regarding him by the things I was doing that was just basically you know, womanizing, you know, desiring material things and money to what then. Gotcha. Who else? How have you hardened your heart to Yahweh? Uh, he has told me to go right and I go left. Somebody do this and I do that. They get on my own, uh, my own abilities or whatever. I think I, I know better than what 
his uh, his plan is. I guess uh, it's hard to know. I know better than God. I know better than God. And if we're all honest, we we all we all say that we know better than God. If we're honest. Those online, anyone want to jump in? How have you hardened your heart to Yahweh? See something in the chat. What did Sister Barbara say? I saw that on there. We're acknowledging it right now, Sister Barbara. Uh, she said, hearted my heart by delaying obedience to what God has told me to do. Mm, delayed obedience. Still disobedience. Delayed obedience. Still disobedience. Go ahead. Um, um, plus the money and wealth. I was trying to find the next job or whatever instead of, you know, trusting in God. Mm-hmm. Like you preached mm-hmm. on, um, do we trust guys? I'm one of those ones that, you know, I, I tell them now, I'm like, oh, I'm not, not, not one of your smart ones. <laughs> I'm like, you know, always trying to negotiate or see what I first read people, try to understand situations, you know, manipulate to your situation where you like, okay, this is the best situation for me, materially wise, money wise, where all the world of God. He's trying to block stuff from you or to protect you. Protect you, you know what I'm saying? Want to get peace. One thing I was dealing with um Indies one time. I was dealing with an HR guy. He was telling me from the age. It was like, Chris, well, we heard you in a situation um some employees don't want to work with you. Same thing. Like, everybody know me um, when it comes to the industry. I want to be nice to you. I'm always a I'm just going to with that. So I'm always going to help you. So it's like, well, a couple of them say they, they don't, they don't want to work with you. I said, well, maybe you don't mind. So a couple of them. So I said, okay. The, the president of the, of the region was there. They tried. So I knew I might have him. I said, okay. I said, so this person that I donated, video games, all the families, these type of situations right there, like that. All the stuff that I've given to them for the maturity and stuff like that, they're afraid of me or something like that. And the president looked at the guy, the district manager guy that had the claim, he was like, got what you got, man. But I wanted to get out of this guy's district. And I was talking to the president and I said, listen, let's take me out of this gentleman's district. He has an issue with something. And he has something wrong with him as far as with me. I say, well, he couldn't understand. I say, listen, peace of mind. Being a woman of God, no matter what your struggle, what your faith walk is, we understand that peace. When you're in here, you have that peace. I'm trying to articulate this to a person that don't understand God. Mm-hmm. Even, even in my walk, stumbling in there, it's peace. Peace. So you have to really literally put a monetary value on them. Okay. Peace of mind is worth a million dollars. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, that kind of peace. When we, when I hardened my heart to God, circling out stuff like that, not trusting in Him, that He got it. He's the creator of the universe. And I'm like, He's the creator of the universe. He healed me a stomach cancer. So I'm like, can't fix a job for me. He healed me a stomach cancer. He can't fix my problems. For me. He can't fix me right. He can't make me right. But no, it's you. It's what you desire. And he gonna what he gonna do is like okay I'm gonna show you I'm gonna let you I'm gonna let you I'm gonna let you do your plan see how your plan gonna you. do what is it gonna do for you the greatest thing about it you get up you allow yourself to when he wakes you up in the morning he allows you to in and then grace of salvation you go okay okay and and the one one thing you guys preach on these things is because he's a patient one now look at that. We don't love him, but he loves us. But that's how I harden my heart. And that's a testimony story about what we deal with when we're dealing with people in the world. We're not supposed to be like that. 
we're not supposed to be so we are not heart we're not like that. And we're not obedient in the way that we want to. But basically for his grace that he understands and love us. Because the true thing is the testimony of God. The true thing is the testimony of the It's the testimony of what salvation is. A lot of people when we talk to them, they're like, what is the salvation stuff? Once again, but we must be people of of God. Christ the individuals on the job like we do. It's a struggle hearing stuff. You be like, they be talking all this stuff. It's like it's it's very hard. But I've learned even from my sister and my mom, people that's all my family strong in the Lord, my wife, um, father, pastor. You go in there, you take authority. But it has to be for me learning more. So why do you? I hate to say so. Sorry. Well, you did it. You did it. <laughs> so, and thank you for those online as well. Because I did see some more comments pop right on up on there. Um, yeah, you can go ahead and read those really quick, and then we'll jump into our discussion for tonight. Sam says self-deception, suppressing truth, avoid facing it. Sister Nina said ignoring signals, direction from God, returning to things God has removed. Our life, and Sister Maureen said, not sharing my testimony at times when I know I should. Yeah, I think we can all find a piece of some place where we all harbor this. But because of His grace and mercy, we are still here. So tonight we're going to be focusing in on the firstborn. The firstborn. So we're going to be in Exodus chapter twelve. 13 through 6. So let's talk about the people of Israel. People of Israel, like all of us, are made in the image of God. Genesis 1, 27. Let us make man in our image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. We are made in the image of God. When we look at that, it's all about who you are rather than what you can do. It's whose you are rather than what you can do. So because you are made in the image of God, you are his. He created you. It's not about your production as the Israelites were looked at by the Egyptian. Your identity is found in you making bricks. Your identity is found in you building this city for me. Your identity is found in you helping me make a name for myself. The people of Israel are descendants of three fathers. Who are the three fathers? Oh, what's so special about Jacob? Oh, God changed his name to Israel. Israel. What else about the people of Israel? They were exiled from the promised land, the land of Canaan, due to the famine. They were out of their land. God promised them this land. There's a famine in the land. Guys, go to Egypt. I'm going to be with you. Go to Egypt. And I'm going to care for you there. They live in Egypt. They live in the fertile land. It kind of looks like a promised land a little bit, but it's not the true promised land that God would have for them. Remember, Egypt is huge. Goshen is, think of Egypt like New York. Goshen is upstate New York. Farmland. They were there for 400 years, but as we see in these chapters, it's 430 years. And God is getting ready to get them out. And we see that God is revealing himself, how we talked about last week, to know Yahweh. Yahweh is revealing himself to them as well through the plagues, not only to the Egyptians, but to the Israelites. So where we are. We're at plague number 10. What's plague number 10? Death of the firstborn. Israel's been sitting back. They have to do nothing. They've just been watching what's been going on to the Egyptians. They haven't had to do anything. All of a sudden, you get to plague 10. Now God wants them to do something. It's time for Israel to make a decision. Either one, you're going to trust 
my story, you're going to trust my narrative, you're going to trust what I'm doing, or you're going to reject what I'm doing. You're going to reject. Which brings us to a question. Did Israel buy into the narrative of Egypt? Did Israel buy into the narrative of Egypt? Meaning, Egypt is where you should be. This is where you're going to stay forever. We have all these gods. Don't worry about the God that you have. These are the gods that you should worship. Did they buy into that narrative? Did they buy into that culture that Egypt had? Possibly initially they did. Possibly initially they did. When they first came there, they were not treated as slaves when they first came there. Mm -hmm. So I would say in the beginning, possibly so. Definitely, if you're a slave, you're not going to buy and hate uh, whatever you the master or wrestle. You're not buying into it? I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Tammy, Sister Tammy yeah. says, yes, that's the wilderness experience. <laughs> If we were to read John 24, 14. Joshua. Thank you, Joshua. <laughs> Joshua 24, 14. Shows you where my mind is going. If we were to read Joshua 24, 14, what do you think it would say? Well, what does it say? Her, read that out loud for me. Therefore, fear the Lord and worship him with sincerity and truth. Get rid of the gods your ancestors worship beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt. Worship and worship. The gods where? Egypt. Yeah. Yeah. Israel started buying into the narrative. Initially, we're good. As you're there longer and longer, you start to forget things. You start to. There you go. That's the word. You start to bring all that culture into you and you start to amalgamate. Start mixing things, mixing ideas, coming up with your own things at times. But they started buying into the narrative of that culture. And you would think, too, because they were there so long, generation ways, one doesn't teach about the Lord. Mm -hmm. Generation, you start losing. So, generation is raised up in that culture. It starts to, like I say, buy into all these gods and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so that's why when Moses comes from by telling them to send me. <laughs> he actually has to introduce the Lord back to his own people, right? Yeah, because they have kind of forgotten who God is. Those years. Right. So like modern times. Is it like modern times? Yeah, yeah. We buy into <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the world. Yeah. Yeah. Do. But also along with that, yeah. The Pharaohs send the original Pharaoh. They didn't know who they they know who they were. Right? There you go. Yeah. Both sides. Both sides. Why do you think God said it was so important for Israel, for Pharaoh, for the Egyptians to know who he was? You look at all this time that has passed. They forgot about Joseph. It's almost like you see this period of silence going on. And then God's like, okay, it's you need to remember who I am because you're not passing it down. So it's time for me to reveal myself. So as we're here, it's time for Yahweh to get Israel out of Egypt. But God comes up with another question. How does Yahweh get Egypt out of Israel? The instruction. Who did I say? Oh, I said the information. I meant the instruction. Oh, okay. So the instruction. <laughs> I apologize. So in your Bibles, if you want to follow along, it's going to be Exodus chapter 12, verses 5 through 7. Sister Pat, if you would go right on ahead, if you can read that. Okay. <laughs> you must have an unblemished animal, a year old male. You may take it from either the sheep or the goats. You are to keep it until the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembly of the community of Israel will slaughter the animals at twilight. 
they must take some blood, take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses where they eat them. Yes, thank you for reading that. So this is the instruction that is going out to the Israelites, but they're not really called Israelites just yet. They're still the people of Israel. Take an unblemished animal, sheep or goat. This is all on the 10th day. Anyone know what the 10th day is? We talked about it last week a little bit, what 10, the number 10 means. Nobody remembers, it's okay. Culmination, put it all together bringing it all together, the summation of everything. Almost, you can kind of almost go towards completeness, okay? They're supposed to keep it until the 14th day of the month. So that's four days. That's where new beginning comes in. So the 14th day of the month. And then what are they supposed to do? Slaughter it. When are they slaughtering it? What time of day? When is twilight? Sunset. Get ready to be dark. The promise. I gave that to you, Chris. Yes. This is going to be Exodus chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. I gave two verses this time, but they two long verses. <laughs> Our path to the land of Egypt on that night. I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute justice. And the Lord, now the Lord, now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Thank you. Who's going to be experiencing this plague? Egypt, Goshen, Egypt, cattle, firstborn males, slaves, uncircumcised, gods of Egypt, everyone who does not have this blood on the doorpost. <laughs> we gonna get there. <laughs> Everyone that does not have the blood on this doorpost is going to face this judgment. It's a promise. It doesn't sound like a promise to some people, but it's a promise. When God says he's gonna do something, he's gonna do it. He sees the blood, what's he gonna do? He's going to pass over, pass by. And they will not be destroyed because they are protected by the blood of man. So was this given just to the Israelites or was this for everybody? Whose hearts were changed? So the Israelites and I think some of the Egyptians too. Mm -hmm. Now, God told Moses, tell this to the Israelites the elders, and what would they have to do? And if they pass it on, and you have ones that had favor with Moses, they would be wanting to hear what's going on as well. That's why when you see, when you go into Egypt, or when they go into the land of Canaan, you're going to have Israelites, you're going to have Egyptians that came with the Israelites as well.
that experience the Passover in terms of when we say the Israelites or were of Israel. Some of them were slaves, probably of varying nationalities. Uh, so even at that point, um, God's blessing of God's covenant to bless goes out to God's people first. Then to everybody else. Jesus came to the Jews first, for the Jews first. And then who else gets to experience it? The Greeks, the Gentiles, who we are. The fulfillment. That's what I meant for you, the fulfillment. Yeah. All right, Exodus chapter 12, verse 29 through 32. The fulfillment. The fulfillment. Acts 13. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. When? Midnight. What time is midnight? Midnight. Is it light outside or is it dark outside? It's dark. Okay. Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon. And all the firstborn of the livestock. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where someone was not dead. And he summoned Moses. No, 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 not yet. <laughs> yeah, stop there. Dark. Pitch black outside. Well, not pitch black. There's still light from the stars. But it's dark out. So nothing good happen when you're out in the dark. This is case in point. Firstborn of every male in the land without the blood on the doorpost. Firstborn of Pharaoh sat on the throne. Firstborn of every prisoner in the dungeon. Firstborn of every livestock wailing and crying, weeping. It was so loud, Pharaoh got up because there was somebody dead everywhere. Nobody was exempt. Nobody. This brings Pharaoh to a point where I personally believe he came to himself because as you were about to read, we'll get to that. As you're about to read, he comes to himself because he's like, y'all need to go. Because yes, everybody looks at me like a God, but if my own son, who's next to be God, is dead. That means I'm a man. That personal. Start taking it personal. So when they get to the son, then, then he starts really, it hits him, I guess. Mm -hmm. Come into my house and, and it, it gets personal. Then it then wakes you out with your eyes, I guess. That wake up call. That wake up call. That ninth plague, it got personal. I mean, his, his God, the problem, the sun God, they treat him like a speed bag. Be <laughs> <laughs> my father, that's his son. Yep. Not hard, his heart. Mm -hmm. Probably at that point, said, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> got <it again. laughs> You got one more. <laughs> Pharaoh's response. Now, Tim, you can read that. <laughs> then he summoned Moses and Aaron by night, said, Up, go out from among my people, both you and the people of Israel, and go. Serve the Lord as you have said. Take your flocks and your herds, and, he, and as you have said, be gone, and bless me also. Mm. Wait a second. Yeah. Wait a second. Time out here. Pharaoh, you can go with conditions. 
<laughs> Bless me too. <laughs> you can go but leave the kids. You can go leave the women. You can go leave the livestock. You can go leave take only the elder. Take the uh, hardworking men. Now it's like take everything, get out. But bless me. Why does Pharaoh say bless me? He needs to get back. He needs to get blessed. How are you going to use a word to define a song? <laughs> say that again. You can say it loud. He starts to believe. This is why I say I personally believe that Pharaoh came to himself. He realized what he was up against. You remember the Egyptians came up to him and said, Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. You need to let these people go because there's going to be nothing left. And God started stripping and taking things away. And then when it got to the firstborn, that light bulb went off. I know what I'm up against. Take everything. Get out. Could Pharaoh have been somebody's firstborn? Could Pharaoh have been someone's firstborn? He could have been. What I guess um what is the significance of first boy? That the oldest child? <laughs> you get the head. Yeah. You get the head. You get the head. <laughs> you know, that's how it is sometimes. Sometimes I'm addressing it. Sometimes it takes something to happen to you personally. Mm. Mm. It's not directly affecting you. <clears throat> you stand apart from it. We keep on the road, but you sometimes get hit home like it might be a death of a loved one, family. It makes you think about your life. Yeah. I think it's interesting, though. Pharaoh, like a lot of us, like you say, sometimes something happens tragically. You may come to God. But only as much to get the, the pain to go away. Right. The Pharaoh doesn't say, I'm going to go with you to worship too. I, I need to worship it. No, he just said, Please bless me. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. You know, and I think that's, that's how a lot of people, you know, look up in church, you know, I, I need the Lord to bless me. It's hard right now. Once the pain goes, we kind of back to our old life. Um, instead of humbly worshiping God, right? Hey. Come on, so. But he, you know, he, he's not recognizing God's powerful. He, he's yet to really want to worship God. Commit. Commit. There you go. So this is just something to ponder. What is God, Yahweh's obsession with the firstborn? I was looking in this scripture, in these passages that we had for homework. The word Egypt or Egyptian is mentioned 50, I think it was 58 or 59 times. Shows that it's important. When we go on later on, it talks about unleavened bread, mentioned that seven times. It talks about Passover 12 times. It talks about blood 21 times. Now, taking all those out, it talks about first and firstborn, and it always has something to do with God 27 times. So taking out Egyptian, because we know that God wants to get Egypt. They want, he wants to get Israel out of Egypt and Egypt out of Israel. He has, it seems like, an obsession with the firstborn. God does. That's what it seems like, right? So let's talk about what's a firstborn. What is the responsibility of a firstborn? That culture... You get a little extra inheritance. Okay? You have a responsibility of taking care of the household when your father passes. So the oldest, who would be the firstborn, would take care of the rest of the family. He would take care of the father's wife. He would take care of the, children, the other brothers and sisters. He would be the quote-unquote father. If the father is still alive, 
He is to represent the Father to others that he comes in contact with while his Father lived. So he's supposed to represent and be an image of his Father when no one else is around. Now, you notice how I have Father kind of bolded. What did it say in Genesis 1, 27? In the image of, in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. All right? So, if we're made in the image of God, should we or should we not represent who created us? If we are children of our father, who we say is God, should we not represent the father to whoever we come in contact with? We should. Because we know our father had not passed, but I will go with Jesus on this one. Since Jesus has passed, what did he do with the disciples? The disciples were to still represent him. And then he ascended, of course, which shows that he's alive and they're supposed to represent him even more. What was Adam and Eve given? They were given the whole earth. This is your inheritance. You ain't do nothing to earn it. This is your inheritance. You get the whole earth. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Don't eat from this one tree. This is your inheritance. Let's reflect for a second. Cain and Abel. Cain was born first. Abel was second. What did Cain do? Killed his brother. Is that representing his father well? No. Esau and Jacob. Esau is the oldest. God chose. Ooh, God chose Jacob. Jacob was a trickster. Reuben and Joseph. Reuben's the firstborn. What about Joseph? Joseph wasn't the firstborn. But when you look at the situation of what was going on, and Jacob passed, who ended up taking care of the family? Joseph. So to answer your question, could Pharaoh have been the firstborn? Possibly. Maybe. Yahweh's firstborn is different than our firstborn. The way that we look at the firstborn. The way that we look at who should have the responsibility. God chose Joseph to take care of the family. He chose Reuben to be born first. But he chose Joseph for the responsibility of taking care of the family. Esau was supposed to get the blessing. Jacob tricked himself to be it. God already chose for Jacob to be. But we look at God's firstborn is completely different than the firstborn that we would look at. So for Pharaoh, he could have been a firstborn. But God has a purpose for him. And his purpose was, as we saw, he wants Pharaoh to know who he is. He sees that he's going to be a vessel because we see that Pharaoh hardens his heart. And then Pharaoh, and then God hardens his heart. Pharaoh willingly hardens his heart. God hardens his heart. So he's a chosen vessel to be used by God for a particular purpose. I guess in that too, I was thinking um, when um, I think Rachel uh, 
subject of the mm -hmm. I got told uh, that the latter will serve the younger, or the younger will serve the older. Mm -hmm. The wording I don't have to correct. But I'm just thinking about when God told her that, and then it came to pass, and then also, I know what I'm trying to say, but it, it's not coming out. But I'm thinking like, God spoke it and said it was going to happen, but he chose before they were even born. Right. Yeah, besides his sovereignty, so remember what did God call Israel while they were in bondage? They said, He said, Pharaoh, let my people go, my firstborn, my firstborn son. Now, Israel is not the firstborn. In God's eyes, they are, but they're not practically living it out. So if you are my firstborn, this is what I have to do to make you, for you to understand that you are my firstborn. Because remember, it's all about us knowing God. If you are to be my firstborn, and I want you to know that you are my firstborn, I have to set you apart. I have to set you apart for me. If you're going to be my firstborn, you're going to be my representative. You're going to represent me in everything that you do. You will be my message. Now, message does require words, but it's more than just words. You're going to be the message. The way you live, the way you act, the way you interact with people, what you eat, the way you, what you wear, the way you carry yourself. If you're my firstborn, I have to set you apart. You are going to look different. You are going to act different. You're going to be my representative because you're always, what you do is going to point back to me. But ultimately, if you are my firstborn, how is this going to happen? This is how. I'm going to set you apart. I have to bring you out of Egypt. But I have to get Egypt out of you. You're going to have to be born again. You're going to have to be born again. Now this whole passage, chapter 12 through 13, screams Jesus everywhere in there. Everywhere. So I want to share with you, everything in Scripture is a picture that can point to the work of Christ. Everything in Scripture is a picture that can point to the work of Christ. I'll give you an example. These are three that I noticed. What are the similarities between the cross and the doorpost and the lintel? Are the Israelites born? Again, in these passages, and hyssop and blood. Three things. Now, everyone's going to have a chance to chime on in. What's a lentil? We'll get to that. <laughs> so, this is a lentil. <laughs> so, in the passage, it says put blood on the lentil, which would be the top part. On the door frames, the side part. Now, why do you see blood on the bottom? That word lintel could also be translated thresholds. Now, if it's thresholds, that would mean both the top and the bottom and the two doorposts, right? So we see blood everywhere on the door. On the top, the sides, and the bottom. Well, let's add something else to it. When you look at the cross, where was the blood? The blood came from Jesus' head, crown of thorns, his hands, because he had what? Nails. 
Jesus' feet because what did he have there? Picture of the cross. Let's see. The next one. Exodus chapter 12, verses 46 through 48. Now, I know this sounds familiar to everybody. Pastor Harris, would you mind reading this one? You got your white gloves for this? Okay. <laughs> the even in one house, you may not take any of the meat outside of the house, and you may not break any of its bones. The whole community of Israel must celebrate. David resides among you. You want to observe the Lord's Passover. Every male in his household must be circumcised. Then he may participate. Come like a native of the land, but no uncircumcised person may eat it. Mm. That sound familiar? Yeah. What's that sound like? Sounds like when we talk about <laughs> communion. Communion. Not a believer. It's your best interest. Not That's right. Not to participate. You may not break any of its bones. Was Jesus' bones broken? Israel is really not hasn't been established at this point as a nation that has been renowned widely in the mm -hmm. area. So, but it says he, um, he shall be as a native of the land. So that's speaking from the same point of what they should do currently, but as well. Of the future in the future. It's good. Let's jump back. We see blood on the doorpost, right? How were they supposed to eat their food? Roasted. Roasted? What were they to have in their hand? Stabbed. Stabbed. Sandals. Sandals. Ready to go. Right? They had to eat it. They had to eat it. <laughs> they had to eat it in a rush. Right? <laughs> hurry. Fast. In a hurry. To be ready to go. Without getting too graphic. Where else do we see somebody coming through a bloody doorway? In a hurry. Hmm? <laughs> you're going to be trying to get out. <laughs> well, you're thinking hard. Is it? Well, it, do, it does reference a New Testament. It is going to reference a New Testament. There you go. Burr. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> a bloody doorway. A child comes through. A bloody doorway. New birth. This screams John chapter 3. The conversation between Nicodemus and Jesus. You can see this. Now, hyssop. What color is hyssop? What color is that? Purple. All right. What color is blood? Red. What's purple symbolize? Royalty. Ah, what's red symbolize? Blood. <laughs> royal blood. Yeah, royal. royal blood. Right? Who's the royal blood? Jesus. Jesus. That royal blood was shed where? On the cross. Everything you see in scripture is always a picture. It can point back to Jesus' accomplished work, especially in this chapter. Especially. Always oh, probably sneak in there too when Christ fled Herod, he went to Egypt. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm going to say, I'll call my first one I eat. Yeah, there you go. Right. 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 Right.
What are some other ones that you see? Chris just gave one. What are some other things that we see that point to Christ in the scriptures? It's a lamb without blemish. Lamb without blemish. Jesus, the perfect, spotless, unblemished lamb. The perfect sacrifice. And I, this has occurred to me on this uh, piece of lake that we've been studying. It is they eat the entire lamb. They couldn't, and they, whatever, if some, someone's left over, it would be burnt mm -hmm. later. So we could not have any like leftovers, like wasted. To me, they kind of pointed to, I guess, the sufficiency in Christ. It's like, it was finished, right? It's, there's nothing left to be done, right? That's He's good. It's sacrifice. And it just, that's that's good. good. The blood that was spilled, it was enough. Jesus' blood didn't go to waste. His blood was the perfect blood, the perfect sacrifice, perfect sacrificial blood. It was just enough for everybody. Those that would believe and those that would trust. <laughs> Donkey in the land. So let's just address the elephant in the room. Exodus chapter 13, verse 13. Now I wrestled with this and I wrestled with this and I wrestled with this. I don't know your name, brother, but can you read it for me? <laughs> Tim. Another Tim? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Every firstborn from a donkey you are to redeem with a lamb. But if you choose not to redeem it, you must break it. You must break its neck. People, you are to redeem every first person. Second half, we don't have a problem with. That's pretty easy. That first part, every firstborn from a donkey, you are to redeem with a lamb. But if you choose not to redeem it, you must break its neck. Now, me and Kelly had a discussion about this. And I had nowhere to go. I kind of got back in the corner on this one. The law has not been given yet. So between Kelly and myself, we were like, okay, donkeys are unclean animals. I, I get that. That's what it says in Leviticus. That's what it says in Deuteronomy. They're unclean animals. Law hasn't been given yet. But a donkey is a beast of burden. Helps with labor. Helps with work. Helps with all these things. Israelites most likely use donkeys to help with their labor, transport things. When you look at this passage, every firstborn from a donkey, Firstborn, God is obsessed with the firstborn. And as you'll see later on, he says, every firstborn is mine. Even an unclean animal like a donkey. You are to redeem it with a lamb. You have a choice. You can redeem it, or you don't have to redeem it. One way or another, something is going to die. Either the lamb is going to die, or the donkey, or the donkey is going to die, or the donkey. And why would you say break its neck? Because it's quick and clean. Quick and clean. Now, as we were talking about, everything points to Christ. Where's the donkey? Think about that. We are the donkey. An Israelite had love for a donkey because it helped him with his labor. If he chose to redeem it, he would get a lamb sacrificed for the donkey. 
if you didn't think the donkey had value, or whatever, it's going to die. Oh, he would give a substitute for the donkey. Where the donkey? God sees fit to show compassion upon a donkey like us. And what does he do? He gives the perfect sacrifice. A lamb. The perfect sacrifice. But the thing is, the choice is ours. Even with being a donkey, the choice is ours. We can either choose to be redeemed and go with God's narrative and God's story and God's plan, or we can reject it, which means we're going to face eternal death, and we are going to be redeemed by our own selves into eternal death. What happens to some more research? Another thing that comes to mind as well, I mean, the nature of a donkey and the nature of a lamb, is that donkey, donkey by nature is known to be very stubborn. <laughs> you know, likewise, throughout the beginning, that guy's making a covenant with people. Mm -hmm. And what does he have to do? Make another, make another, make another. So we as people, stubborn such that we would have never been more it's the same, same man. When's the next time you really hear about a donkey that has a key part? So his nature is to, to be stubborn. And a donkey is obedient but can be stubborn when it wants to be. Right. I'm just like us. Go ahead. I'm just thinking of reading Nick and the Lord had called, you know, when they, the, the Israelites weren't <coughs> obeying him. Um, you know, these are stiff necked people. Mm -hmm. you about the, when you were saying stubborn, right. stiff neck, stubborn. Right. <laughs> but you look at this, it all points to the patience that God has shown. Because even in Israel's disobedience, as we saw in Joshua, they started worshiping the gods of Egypt. But he still called them his firstborn son. He still called them his firstborn son. And for them to actually live it out and realize it for themselves, This has to take place. Blood has to be spilled. They have to be born again. They have to have a new identity. They have to know who God is. And this is how they are going to get redeemed. Through the sacrificial system. Through the blood. And then we'll get into the rest of that next week. So in preparation for next week. I made your homework pretty easy. Pray. We're going to go from Exodus chapter 13, verse 17, through chapter 15. The big question that we're going to ask is how are we to understand Yahweh's justice and mercy? Because they go hand in hand. God's justice and his mercy in these passages. And then we're really going to put it all together. So remember, week one, we talked about identity. So how has Yahweh shaped your identity? Number two, week two, we talked about knowing God. So you know Yahweh. So how did you get to know Yahweh? How did he get your attention to know? that he was Yahweh. Number three, remember, if you say that you're a follower of him, that means you're a firstborn. You have a responsibility. It's an honor and a privilege.
to be one of his firstborns, to be a representative of who the Father is. So how are you Yahweh's firstborn? And then last but not least, what is an application that you can share with others based on identity, to know Yahweh, and firstborn? And if you can't see, that whole last part is about your testimony and evangelism. About sharing your testimony, but it's also about evangelizing. That whole last part. All right. That's good for tonight. I pray everybody got something out of this. I pray it wasn't too hard on people. I pray it was very easy to understand. I mean, there's so many little nuances in these passages, and it's a lot to cover. So trying to pull just one point and just go from there, it's hard, but I believe the Lord is working with this. So there is nothing else. If there's any other discussion, we will take that offline. For the bird, I'm going to ask you to pray us out. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father, once again, we are so grateful and thankful for your mercy. We're thankful all for this class tonight as we continue to study your word, as you continue to open it up to us and we learn more from it. Just say thank you tonight, Lord, as uh, we're about to leave here and go to our homes. We give a safe passage to travel to our homes and those who are online. But we just thank you for this class. Just continue to, to grow us up, to be what you would have us to be, not what we want to be, what you want us to be. Direct our steps. We give you all the honor and the glory is to In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 And any prayer requests?